Jim Sillers, Jim Sillers is, is a well-known uh, character on the political stage in Scotland and has been for decades. Um, uh, he hails from Ayrshire. Um, my granny was from Trim, um, not, not far away from, from Jim's original stamping ground. Um, he was elected to Parliament uh, back in 1970, uh, but I think at that stage, um, one thing was apparent. Most politicians are relatively grey. They fill the position that they're expected to. They do what they're tell. They're not free thinkers. They're part of a party machine. And I think um, one thing you can definitely say about Jim Sillers is that he thinks for himself and he isn't feared to say so. And he has over decades. Um, made a, a, a massive contribution um, to the political life of Scotland and even when you disagreed with him he's always been there um, to, to make his contribution. Jim Sillers probably became most prominent um, right at the beginning of the pulp tax campaign and just to remind um, some uh, of our uh, younger members of the audience, Margaret Thatcher visited a form of local taxation um, on the United Kingdom where everyone paid the same, irrespective of whether you had uh, millions in the bank or, or whether you were on uh, the equivalent at that time of a minimum wage. And she visited it on Scotland first, a year before the rest of the United Kingdom, something which many folk have not forgiven Thatcher for, even though there is a long list um, of unforgivable acts. <laughs> too many, too many to, to go through. Um, but um, tellingly, tellingly, the Labour Party at that time just said, put your head down, just deal with it. Um, at that time, the anti poll Tax Federation organised a Scotland-wide non-payment campaign which actually put the poll tax to bed. It wasn't a parliamentary campaign. This was ordinary folk saying, we're not going to pay, you're going to have to fight us to get it. Such was the injustice felt um, nationally. Jim Sillers was one of a number of individuals on the national stage who embraced that concept and actually gave it some form of momentum. Um, so much so that standing as the SNP candidate on a non-payment campaign, he beat soundly the Labour candidate, um, who I have to say put a particular lack luster performance. Um, but Jim Sillers, Jim Sillers has, has made a, a great contribution um, in the political uh, life of, of this country, um, both initially in the Labour Party, latterly uh, in, in the SNP, and in the middle um, in, in the Scottish Labour Party, which um, some of you will remember. Um, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll pass over to Jim Sillers. <laughs> Irish, 
the French, the Fijians, the front page of every newspaper, every single report in Scotland and BBC, when I had them in front of them demanding an apology. But it appears to be that you can say anything you like about the Scots and we are supposed to take it. Well, if I'm successful in the contribution I make in stirring up the working class and getting you to realise that you are a talented people, you've got enormous ability, the great problem is you believe the lies that have been told about you. Some folks say, ah, no voting because of Alex Salmon. What about voting for Cameron and Osborne and Clay? Is that what you want to do? Now, I'm a member still, despite my disagreements with Ali, I have never been expelled. Unlike Ali, who was expelled once. <laughs> <laughs> But, in 2016, in the first independence election, I am not going to vote for the SNP. I am a socialist. I saw the SNP as a vehicle to bring us to the point of independence. And when that vehicle has done its work, and it's brought us to the point of independence, and we win it, I am going to vote in 2016 for socialist candidates for Holyrood, wanting a working class parliament in Holyrood to give the working class people of Scotland the policies we want but have been denied time after time after time. campaign I ever fought in South Ayrshire. There's a village outside of Cumnock called Netherthart. And an old miner got up, a retired miner, and he said that he wanted, then, 1979, he wanted an independent Scotland. And the words he used burned into my head. What he said was, if you look at Scotland's working class history, all our socialist dreams have been destroyed by the London Connection. We've voted socialists, we've sent socialists south, but we haven't had any socialism except once from Atlee's government in 1945. Since then, it's been disappointment and betrayal. So, I'm got to say to the working class folk, we are the majority inside Scotland. If we want an independent Scotland, we can have an independent Scotland. And if we want a working class majority in that independent parliament, nothing on earth can stop us from having a working class parliament and a working class government. Nothing on earth except one thing. We believe in the myth of our own inadequacy drummed into our skulls time after time after time. Now I've got a question to ask a working class audience. Why don't you think of standing for the Scottish Parliament? Why are you content to allow somebody to go to university, to become a researcher for an MP, and then become an MP or an MSP? No experience of life whatsoever. Everybody in here, from the working class, will have been skimped, hard up, gone through a great deal of trauma, bringing up families. Know what it's like to be insecure, to be worried about redundancy and worried about jobs. Everybody in here has a breadth and a depth of knowledge far superior to most of the people we send to Westminster and we send to Hollywood. So really the challenge isn't just to vote yes, it's to get a hold of the political organisations and take charge of them so that you become the elected people working on behalf of the working class in Scotland. Now we live in a, I think sometimes I live in a parallel world at the moment. The Daily Record a couple of days ago carried a full page advert 
from Better Together, which says more powers for Scotland without the risk and uncertainty of leaving the UK. It's the best of both worlds. On another page of the Daily Record, same edition, Scots eat, eat two million food bank dinners. And it's referring to this document, below the bread line, which is produced by organisations that have to organise the food banks from one end of the UK to the other. Now, they've told us the best of both worlds. And they've said, Alistair Darling says, a great historic agreement is on the cards. Labour, Tory and Lib Dems are now agreed on the powers they'll give to the storage parliament. Well, let them do it now. The Queen's speech last week only lasted 10 minutes because there's such a light legislative programme at Westminster. There's bags of time. If they're all in that agreement for them to produce a bill and have the second reading in Parliament so that we can see in legislative detail, not verbal promises, legislative detail, what it is they've got an offer if we vote no and we can compare it with the powers of independence. and that will give us 40% control of the Scottish budget. Well, Joanne Lamont might think that I'm not genetically fit, but I know that if I control 40% and somebody else controls 60%, 60% controls the 40%. And that's what's all going to be on offer for our people. Then they tell us that the United Kingdom the, another advert last week talked about getting the strength of the United Kingdom around us. You remember the Queen's Jubilee when she sailed up the Thames in a wee boat with the Duke of Edinburgh dressed as an admiral of the fleet. Why did she sail up the Thames in a wee boat? Every other Jubilee, the monarch reviewed the fleet. There's no fleet to review. <laughs> and the reason is, this so-called strength they want around us is a United Kingdom that's skint. You know what the national debt is today? It's 1.3 trillion pounds. Heading for 1.5 trillion in 2017. You know what that means? Last year, they mentioned it, this year, running up to the 2015 general election, no mention of it whatsoever. After the election next year at Westminster, we are going to have the first tranche of £25 billion pounds worth of cuts. That's not my figure, that's John Osborne's figure, and it's also Ed Ball's figure. That's what's going to descend upon us if we vote no and remain in the Union. So if you think this is austerity in your face, you just wait till after 2015 if we vote no. Because it won't be just one 25 billion, it'll be 25 billion and 25 billion as they try to balance the books and stop borrowing. Borrowing this year is £100 billion. Pounds. And if you're £1.3 trillion in debt and you're borrowing £100 billion, you are skint. And if you don't believe me about the wee boat up the Clyde, look at the aircraft carrier they're about to launch. They're going to launch an aircraft carrier, but they can't afford to put aircraft on the aircraft carriers. <laughs> That's a country that's actually a fading power. Now we can break away from it. What we can do with the power of an independent working class government is enormous. We've got 100
157,000 families on the housing waiting list at the present time. There's only one way to solve that when we've got the power. You build houses. And if you build houses, somebody's got to quarry the sand, somebody's to make the cement, somebody's to manufacture the bricks, somebody's to transport the site, and you need plumbers, slaters, brickies and jiners to make the house become a home for people. So now the Tories would say, ah, socialist pie in the sky, how do you pay for it? Well, you pay for it by taking a lesson from an Iron Bevan. An Iron Bevan said, the greatest armament in a socialist is audacity. The audacity to think the way you're not supposed to think and to act in the way the establishment tells you you cannot act. So let's apply audacity to building the houses. How do we pay for it? Well, there's a thing called the Private Finance Initiative, which Gordon Brown and Company got private enterprise to build their hospitals and a number of schools. In Edinburgh, where I live, the Royal Infirmary before it buys a bandage, has to pay £56 million to the PFI provider. That's the first charge on that NHS budget. Well, no problem if you're a working class government in a working class parliament and you've got audacity. You bring them in and tell them we're going to renegotiate the contracts. And they're going to say no, no, no. Come up 
they hardly go beyond the line Edinburgh and Glasgow because it's very costly going up into the Highlands. Think what it would be if there's no fuel duty. And that's what it would mean. No fuel duty on petrol and diesel. They would go further. We've got a stimulus on the tourist industry and we get jobs. That's the kind of thing we can do if we are in control of our own affairs. Now I want to end by saying this to you. All of my political life, we have been engaged in the working class in Scotland in a defensive posture. All our energy has been used trying to defend ourselves. Way back in 1915, the women had to go against rising rents during the great Glasgow rent strike. We've been defending ourselves against closures, against deindustrialization, against rising unemployment, against rising poverty. We're defending ourselves against the poll tax, defending ourselves against the bedroom tax. All that energy taken up in trying to defend policies coming from across the border, we would never vote for. Think what we can do with that energy in an independent Scotland with a working class government where we don't need to defend any longer. We can use our energy and our intellectual ability to build a fair and decent society. That's the difference between 7 o'clock and 10 o'clock on the 18th of September, you and me are sovereign. We have sovereign power in our hands for those 15 hours. What do we do at one minute past 10? If we voted no at one minute past 10, we've given it away and remain a minority inside a state that's failing and doesn't care about it. If we voted yes, at one minute past ten, for the Scottish working class, at long, long last, our time will have come. <laughs>